Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're, I'm going to pass back over to Stephen now, who is going to take us into our first panel, looking at uh, the sort of what's happening in the regions and locally across the UK. Stephen. Great. Thanks, Sam. And a huge thanks to, um, to Mims Davies as well, who's such a sort of um, um, committed um, minister who's worked so hard across the last 18 uh, months on all of those initiatives. And um, thank you to her for her engagement and, and sharing um, all, the, all, that's, all that's going on there uh, from DGBP and across government. Now, one of, one of the things that Mims talked about was trying to join up some of this support, including through things like um, youth hubs. And um, um, we know, as I think I said at the start, there's big um, uh, differences in the nature of the youth employment challenge across different parts of the UK and across different groups of uh, young people. So we need a tailored set of support. We need to join up that uh, massive le le uh, list of things that's going on. We need to join those all up. And of course, local government um, and local employers and local providers have their own initiatives um, as well. So, so this panel is really going to look at that, um, that local angle. So what's going on locally across different parts of the UK? How are we joining some of those things up? What are some of the challenges? What other initiatives of, of, of local areas got um, that we can learn from uh, more broadly? Um, and I'm going to be chairing this in a double act with um, Cushy, who I'm going to pass over to introduce herself in a second. Um, Sam introduced herself and Josh as the, as the Anton Deck uh, partnership of, of this event. And Cushy, haven't, we haven't agreed. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm not going to open this up. We're not going to do a poll on which, which double acts we are. It could end very badly. But Cushy, we're really pleased to have you with us. I know you're going to say a little bit about yourself um, and uh, your background and, and what you're up to. And then you're going to uh, introduce um, each of our um, speakers. So Cushy, over to you. Thanks, Stephen. So hi, everyone. I'm Cushy Bat. Um, I am an ambassador from EY Foundation. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about EY Foundation, what we kind of do. So we're an independent charity supporting young people from, like myself, from low income backgrounds to get relevant work experience, employability skills, training and careers guidance for the future. Um, I'm also a Smart Futures alumni, which is one of the programmes we carry out for our young people. Um, and I'm currently in second year of sixth form studying business, economics and accounting A level. Um, I'm from the northwest in Manchester, and today I will be co-chairing with Stephen from Learning and Work Institute. So before we start our panelist session, can I just ask the audience to ask any questions they like in Slido, and then we'll ask these questions at the end in our Q&A session to our four panelists. So now we're going to be moving on to our panelist session. We have four panelists with us today from different regions to talk to us about youth employment locally. Our panelists are Tony Wilson, Director and in Institute for Employment Studies. Um, we've got Claire Hatton, Head of Employment and Skills Delivery from West Midlands Combined Authority. Diana Neal, Strategic Lead for Enterprise Economy and Skills from London Council and Councillor Rebecca Langton, Portfolio Holder for Skills, Growth and Economic Development at Nottingham City Council. So if I can first ask Tony to go first and talk to us today, that'd be great. Great, thank you. I hope you can all um, you can all see me and hear me okay. Good, I've got a nod from Stephen, so that's great. I'm just gonna share, I think I've got six minutes, so I'm going to, um share my screen uh and just quickly run through um a quick presentation that's okay Hope, I'll, hopefully you can see this i'm going to assume you can good right so um so look first i really enjoyed that session from mims um that was great i was watching it on on youtube um i have a slightly different perspective i suppose and so at first i thought i'd start just by saying a little bit about the crisis we've got and the crisis perhaps we thought we'd have Couple, a couple of really big challenges and then how we make sense of this locally. So I'll bring it back to the local. I'm not going to start on the local. So as Stephen said, you know, the great news, we can all, can we all go home now? Youth unemployment is falling, falling fast, which is great, back towards pre-crisis levels. But youth unemployment has always been a pretty rubbish measure for various reasons, which I won't have time to go into. 
um, of what's going on in the labour market, even worse when you start talking about unemployment rates for, for subgroups, for different groups of young people. We need to look at employment. And we can talk about the PAYE data, as the minister did, until the cows come home, but the labour force survey data is, is the official measure of employment. The PAYE data has a lot of issues. Young people were hit hardest in the crisis. There's no question about that. And it has not recovered to pre-crisis levels. This has been a jobs light recovery across the economy. It's been particularly jobs light for young people. The only thing we haven't had a crisis for young people, a bigger crisis for young people, is a flight to education. And this graph is a bit harder to explain. You'll get the slides um, <clears throat> separately or you'll find them in a report that we published um, today with IPPR. Um, but, the, um, but the key block here is the dark grey one. This is the increase in young people in full-time education who are not working. And the other ones are falls in young people, um, falls variously in people who are in work and in education, in work, not in education, but thankfully also falls in the number of people who are not in education or not in work. Um, so we, we've averted a crisis or a flight to education. But this has happened actually across age groups. We've had a flight out of the labour market and we estimate there's a million fewer people in the labour market than there would have been on pre-crisis trends. This is the largest fall in economic participation that we've had in at least 50 years. I can't emphasise enough how far the current supply chain crises or um, labour market crisis generally in the economy, even with record vacancies and particularly and partly driving record vacancies, is being driven by labour shortages, not just by skill shortages. A million fewer people in the labour market. One fifth of that fall compared to pre-crisis trends is young people. The yellow here is the growth in economic inactivity. So that's young people not in work and not looking for work. The blue is population changes. So actually the population is a bit smaller for 18 to 24, slightly bigger for 16 and 17. Important point to note here, men are on the left, women on the right, is that, is that the, 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 the fall in participation has actually been greater for men. The, the, the flight into education has been somewhat greater. Um, um, men are slight, young men are slightly less likely to be in education anyway. So this is it's a slightly kind of equalizing effect. But there's one fifth fall and young people only account for about one, uh, about a ninth of the labour market overall. So this is disproportionate fall in participation of young people. And previous work we did for Youth Futures and Blaygrave Trust um, called an unequal crisis, looked actually at the impacts of the crisis on different disadvantaged groups. And even though we've averted an absolute jobs apocalypse, nonetheless, there are clear disadvantages for disabled people, those with health conditions, um, for parents, um, for the lowest paid, the least qualified. And the point we focused on in that report was in, was in particular for ethnic minority groups, where the fall in employment rates was greatest, and this will still be the case even if we updated this now, the fall in employment rates has been greatest in particular for black young people and for Asian young people, recognising that, 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 that these are very broad groups and, and there's a range of factors underneath this and different experiences, driven in particular by occupational changes, check the sorts of jobs that were lost and, and also underlying, um, uh, un underlying um, trends around economic participation, but particularly strong disadvantages. Now look, coming back to local then, the local disparities in this crisis. This crisis may or may not have widened inequalities. In some respects, it's, you know, it's hit areas pretty equally hard. It's been that kind of crisis. And it's hit actually some prosperous areas particularly hard, like London. <clears throat> but undoubtedly, the disparities between areas stand out more clearly here because unemployment has risen everywhere. Employment, more importantly, employment has fallen everywhere. Um, and it's those ex-industrial, those coastal, and those inner city areas that now stand out as having had the most significant impacts. The darker shaded areas here are places with, that have had disproportionate growth in universal credit claims, um, compared to young people on universal credit compared with other areas. Some of these, you know, double the rate of growth, of, of um, at disproportionate levels, I should say, double the, 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 the levels of, um, of national average areas. And even when, um, even when um, uh, you know, with, with this recovery, it's really important to note there's still one in nine young people not in educational work. This is not job done. You know, we had a crisis before. We just didn't talk about it. We had a crisis before the pandemic. And it's particularly around economic inactivity, people not looking and not available for work, particularly due to health conditions. Um, and, one in, and, and that figure has been virtually unchanged over decades. You see the impact of recessions in the yellow, which is unemployed. But we do nothing about uh, uh, tackling this underlying challenge of, of people who are, who are further, furthest from work and most disadvantaged. One undoubted bright spot, though, and a big shout out to everyone who's delivering Kickstart and delivering employment support more generally for young people. Long term youth unemployment, the blue line here is dropping, dropping like a stone. It's remarkable. 
like this is such fantastically positive news. And I do believe part of this is a result of the plan for jobs. I think many people on this call can pat themselves on the back for the work they're doing delivering it and, and the campaigning work they've done to call for it. Um, we've got a lot to do, but this shows public policy can really make a difference, I believe. We shouldn't just write off those people who are economically inactive and write off those groups who are harder to help. This is kind of the mess is the plan for jobs. I mean, there's so much stuff here. I've run out of time. There's so much stuff here. Crazy amount of stuff that's been announced. Um, and, you know, <laughs> you're trying to make sense of it. I don't envy you trying to deliver it. Um, you know, this is a lot and a lot of that's welcome. But how we make sense of that system for young people, for individuals, for employers, for, um, uh, and for local employers, really importantly, and, as well, and for local partners, you know, it's really hard. And the plan for jobs was a plan to address mass unemployment. That is not the crisis we've got. My biggest fear is the spending review will conclude we don't need the, the investment anymore. Actually, we've got a crisis of mass shortages now, and we've got an underlying crisis of economic inactivity, of disadvantage, um, and of worklessness we must address. This is from work that I did when I was at Learning Work Institute with the Local Government Association. This shows, just illustrates the complexity of the system across funding streams, funders and delivery models, to, um, delivery streams. And this quote really exemplifies it um, uh, from a young person who wasn't in education or employment at the time and, and what it's like trying to navigate that. You know, I, I don't think we necessarily have a problem about a lack of funding overall. I think we've got a problem about coherence and we've got a problem about that we need system change. We've got a problem that everyone is responsible, but nobody is really accountable in, at that sort of uh, at that highest level around making sure young people make good, good transitions. So final point, we published a report today with IPPR called A Better Future. Various of the graphs today are taken from that report, um, funded by Blago Trust and Youth Futures Foundation. And in there, we set out tons of analysis about how we can build a better future, and in particular, how investment in a green and clean future can create more jobs for young people. But fundamentally, I know this is a panel about young about about local areas. I may have strayed a bit off topic. You know, making this work locally means we have to address this, this incoherence in the system. We've got to recognise different areas of different needs. Um, and I think we need fundamentally a new approach to how we how we support young people. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from Claire and others who are trying to deliver that in combined authorities and in local areas. I want to see that happening everywhere um, and us place, placing much greater power and control in local areas. Um, and working much better in partnership with local areas as national government to create a more coherent system that, that, that doesn't just support you if you're on the right bit of universal credit and the right age, but joins up support to make sure you get the help you need to get a job, get a good training place, get an apprenticeship, stay in education and make a good transition. Um, uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Can I now request Claire to Go next, please. Thank you. And hi, everybody. Um, never, never easy to follow, Tony. Um, so um, I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the West Midlands, about um, what those numbers feel like for us in the region, what are the sorts of things we've done, uh, where we think we are making a difference and, and what more we need to do. And, and, and lots of this will reflect on the things Tony's um, set out in numbers and also some of the things uh, Mims talked about. And, and I was really, um, I suppose the one thing that, that really resonates with me from what Tony said was, was coherence. And, and I think we'll come to that again because there is a lot of stuff, but it isn't coherent and I guess that would be our overarching message um, from a regional perspective so West Midlands what what does it feel like what are those what are those numbers playing out and what are we seeing um, I guess if you look at the top line uh, you would say that the labour market is um, starting to recover and, and, and it is coming back although we still have real significant challenges um, we've got a slower reduction in claimant count um, and we've got real underlying issues, many of those issues that were there before, but those issues have been exacerbated and further exposed uh, by the pandemic. So our employment rate is starting to rise again. Uh, our number of claimants um, is starting to fall in the region, but at a slower rate than the UK more broadly. Uh, and that's and that's worrying for us. Uh, and, and even within our region, the claimant fit picture really varies in, a, a, across the region. So Coventry and Warwickshire, which um, saw claimant counts uh, rise most rapidly, has seen them fall most rapidly as, as the labour market has started to return. Where we had those real stubborn issues before, Birmingham particularly, it's got such a slow rate of claimant reduction in the region uh, and, we, and we, we're not even closing in on pre-pandemic levels. Um, 
uh, specifically on young people, we, we do see the number of claimants falling, but again, at a slower rate than, than the UK more broadly, which is really concerning for us. Um, so some real entrenched issues. And when we when we look at this, when we look at the data and when we talk about it, lo lots of it's masked by onflows, offflows, by temporary jobs, but by what we do. And I still don't think we understand enough so that the data tells us something but, but what we, we don't really know is, is the motivations of young people. We don't really know that the barriers, the challenges, and, and we group things too generically. We talk about the challenges for BAME young people, like it's some kind of homogeneous group. And that's a huge mistake to do that in terms of when you're designing policy and interventions. One size does not fit all. You know, people are different. Young people are different. Groups are different. That There isn't that level of uniformity about people's ambitions and people's barriers. And I think we've got to just be a little more thoughtful, both in our analysis, but, but not just the analysis, the application of that. It's, it's easy to say, oh, we need an intervention for young people and it'll look like this and it'll be the same everywhere. I don't think that is giving us the penetration. And what we can see is it is not giving us the penetration into those groups that need the most help. So we've got to be more thoughtful, more targeted and more precise with our language, with our policy making and, and with our interventions. So I, I guess in summary, for us, youth unemployment was way too high before the pandemic, you know, for a for a region that has the, the youngest city um, in Europe uh, and one of the most diverse cities in, in the country as well. Uh, things we always boasted about in terms of um, attracting businesses and things like the Commonwealth Games, City of Culture, that now is a real issue for us. Um, youth unemployment was too high before. Youth unemployment is way, way, way too high now and, and it's not coming down fast enough. And I don't think we are applying enough pressure and enough levers to be able to, to make the difference um, at the rate we need to. So us as a CA, uh, Combined Authority, our agenda, it remains the same. It's about inclusive growth for people, for communities and businesses. And our role in this is a convener, a collaborator, a commissioner, and, and sometimes an agitator. And, and I think, but we often say when we're talking about this agenda that no one agency or department is accountable for youth unemployment. And we've heard them talk about a DWP's role and, and invariably they play a big part in it. But the fragmentation of the solution is starting at the policy level, you know, between different departments, between things. And, and that fragmentation multiplies as it gets closer to the young person. You layer on local authority initiatives, ESF initiatives, all the different things that happen then. And, 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 and it becomes so incoherent. It becomes really difficult to navigate for both employers and young people. And I guess, uh, and I would say this, wouldn't I? That's why we would argue for place-based governance. Um, and that doesn't always mean devolution, but that does mean shared accountability at an economic geography that makes sense, where you can where you can tailor this to your people and to your businesses, because it's an agenda we're all responsible for, and we all need to do something about. So I guess that, that's a picture for us in the West Midlands and, and some thoughts. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we try and work in the region, some of the things that we do, um, how we try to use our understanding of the labour market and our understanding of young people and how we flex some of the, the powers we have got, particularly our adult education budget and how we, how we work in the region to try and tailor those solutions. So we always co-design our provision with employers and providers. And we started this on the beginning of our journey, sort of four years ago with our construction gateway, where there was a shortage of labour for entry roles. And, and but lots and lots of young people doing level one and two construction in colleges, big, long year, full time courses and not getting into jobs. And and it wasn't rocket science and it didn't take us long to get to the position where what employers were asking for was a different set of skills and a CSCS card, you know, a license to practice. So we kind of said, well, that's what we'll deliver. That's what we'll fund. And, and we won't fund the other stuff um, and we'll push young people through those programs and, and older adults as well so that they can move into work much more quickly rather than putting them onto courses so that they're occupied in full time education when that isn't what moves somebody in to employment. So we really try to be working at the coalface with our employers and providers and we, and we try to listen. And, and if there is a funding flexibility, we can apply to that to fund something that will make a difference and get people a job. That's one of the things we do. Um, and we 
also identifying work at niche levels. Uh, you heard the minister talking about, about swaps uh, and swaps are also often talked about hospitality care, I think were the two she mentioned. Those come up time and time again, but what we've tried to do is kind of extend that definition. And we've looked at actually what, what is a swap more generally? What are the other roles we can move people into? And we've been working with our local authorities who, as a result of investment um, post pandemic, have got a really increase in housing officers. So instead of your usual two or four week swap at level one, we have a, a 12 week swap now, step into housing officers for people to recruit from. So, so we're, we're continually trying to look at that. And, and we're now introducing as well what we call a swap plus. So it's not good enough just to get somebody into a job. We want to help people progress. So it's a job plus either an apprenticeship if the employer is up for that or a fully funded level two or level three as appropriate through the adult education budget so that we're offering more and that work coaches can offer more. So it's not just to do this course and get a job. It's do this course, get a job, and then pick up some more training that can help you progress your career. So it's really trying to map out those routes for people and, and to work just a little bit differently and a little bit more locally. And, and the final sort of example um, is how we can move at pace around some of this. And we don't always get it right, but, but HGV, you've seen that a couple of weeks ago, um, DFE launched a national tender. We've been doing this with DWP in our region since the spring. We co-fund it. We'd already identified there was an issue. We'd already contracted through our providers, driver training between us and DWP are paying for the license, the medical and the training costs. We can move at speed. And that, that is the beauty about working at a more local level. You can hear what's happening on the ground and you can respond to that. And we can test and take slightly more risks, I think, uh, that the national bodies can do. So on the youth employment agenda, we worked with a couple of colleges to, to design an entirely new programme that they wanted to come up with. They had a strong belief that a lot of local young people for them wanted to work, wanted to earn money, um, and, and did want to study as well. So we agreed to fund a programme that the part, first part of the program was getting people licenses, uh, be it door supervisors, be it gym instructors, something people wanted to do. And they could either step off at that point or they could work part time and earn and then they could study as well. Uh, and to do that, we just agreed an amount of money we would pay that would include outreach, that would include support. So we took that risk to say, actually, how can we work differently with you? Recognise that you've identified this need with young people. How can we support that? So we work really closely so that's the sort of things we do in the region um and no, we're, we're, just, we're just a few minutes over so we sort of talk, just draw to a close. I want to leave some time for questions as sorry well. be really quick two well 30 seconds then what more can be done um it isn't enough it we're just scratching the surface um we we definitely need more devolved responsibility accountability we need a role in apprenticeships we've seen numbers drastically fall for young people we need to be able to help convene that in the region we definitely need careers to be led and shaped um, at a more local level and coming to funding we do need that single pot and we need that longer term certainty so we can build the infrastructure we need Okay, Sorry, thank, thank you. And I'm because you're going to introduce our next two speakers. I'm going to step in when you've got one minute to go, please, and please try and uh, stick to the five to six minutes, and then we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. Thank you, Claire. Can we now have Diana to go next, please? Hi, thank you, Kishi. Um, good to be here. I'm Diana Neal. Um, I work for London Council's membership organisation for all the London boroughs and the City of London. I'm going to say a little bit about the impact of the pandemic on young Londoners and then what we've been doing in response um, and what we'd like the government to do a little bit more of. So um, young Londoners definitely been adversely affected by the pandemic in many ways. We've seen digital exclusion for some. We've seen increasing the mental health problems, a drop in apprenticeship opportunities and for us record um, levels of youth unemployment. So we really do need to take a holistic approach to some of those issues, um, not just focus totally um, on unemployment. As Tony says, actually London's labour market has been worst hit by the pandemic among the UK regions. It is, you know, levels are now slowly reducing, uh, but the 18 to 24 year olds have been among our worst affected groups. Um, we had youth unemployment peaking at um, uh, just under 26% in, in September 2020 in London. And it was the group that had the fastest growth in unemployment, I think mainly explained because of their concentration in some of those sectors most hard hit by the lockdown. So retail, accommodation and food 
arts and entertainment. And in addition, in London, we had, you know, quite a drastic reduction of commuters coming into the CAS and lack of international tourists. Um, we did see a reduce in unemployment for, for young Londoners as the economies reopen. But unfortunately, in London, our rates are going up again since March 2020. So we're, we're against the national trend. Um, and now, um, Mar March 2021, we're seeing that um, uh, youth unemployment is at 22% in London. Um, that's 9.2% higher than pre-pandemic rates, and it's over a thousand young Londoners um, unemployed. And as Tony said, that's probably, as you say, not, not the true picture of the numbers that are there. We're unclear about what the impact of the end of furlough might bring, um, but we've got just under 25,000 under 25s that were on furlough in London in, in, in September. So quite a significant number of young Londoners needing there. And we're concerned about, you know, long term scarring impacts for those young, young people who've had long term, uh, long periods of unemployment. And as other speakers have said, you know, the impact has also been unequal, both in places, but also among groups, and it's exacerbated existing inequalities. So young black men in London, three times more likely to be unemployed than young white men, those with low or no qualifications in London disproportionately affected, as have young women actually in London, um, uh, uh, which is quite specific to that age group. So in terms of what, what we've been doing in London as a response, well, we're working with the investment via the plan for jobs, which you know, we've, we've welcomed uh, 24 boroughs out of our 33 are directly involved in Kickstart, either as an employer or a gateway organisation. And a lot of the others are supporting um, Kickstart gateway organisations. We set a guide out developing what a sort of good kickstart placement could look like because we really wanted these to be quality placements. I have to say we're frustrated at the lack of data about kickstart and who's on it. Um, and, and, and we're concerned about the low take up of placements. But, you know, it, as Tony says, it's done a really good job. It's a good scheme um, and I'll come on to how we'd like to see it extended. Boroughs themselves are providing their own local services. The London Borough of Lambeth has put in a youth guarantee for young people who are in transition. So they get a guaranteed support to find work, apprenticeship or further education. And Waltham Forest is doing some really interesting work about growth sectors and getting young people really aware about the local growth sectors in their area but also building networks and confidence as well, but just understanding that breadth of opportunity that might be on their doorstep, which we think is a really important thing. At a pan-London level, there's a, a London recovery board that has been set up. It's co-chaired by the chair of London councils, who's got Georgia Gould and the mayor of London. And um, that set out nine missions for recovery. And one of those includes good work for all Londoners, which is, has a focus on those most impacted on the pandemic. And also a new deal for young Londoners, which is focused on it, focusing on improving a mentoring offer for London. I think that emphasis on good work is really important. I think we're seeing too many young people and this was pre-pandemic, but I think it again stands now that we're in sort of insecure, low paid work. And we want to really provide clearer and better progression routes into particular growth sectors in London. So we've identified a kind of sector focus um, that includes digital, green industries, creative and cultural and health specifically, as well as those some um, currently um, experiencing skill shortages such as hospitality and care. Uh, and the Mayor of London is developing sector skills academies within those sectors with an emphasis on um, providers really working closely with employers to develop um, clear progression routes, but also to have that as inclusive as possible because some of those sectors are really quite undiverse and uninclusive. Um, so, um, Youth unemployment, as I said, it's still high in London. It's still a concern for us. And so it was a central, and, and for our politicians, so it was a central part of our spending review submission. Um, and we put in um, uh, both sort of things that we wanted the government and to work with the government on in short term and then some longer term things. In the short term, we're really keen to, to sort of be able to flex some of the programmes such as Restart and other programmes and offer early entry to young people in, in a voluntary sense, um, particularly sorry those... To to sorry to interrupt, oh. just one minute if you could okay. please. Yeah, I'm almost finished. So, so, um, uh, and um, yeah, so early entry onto those 
programmes, particularly if you've been on furlough, which is essentially you may well have been unemployed for six months. So can we do that? Um, so get some more intensive supports quickly. Repurpose kickstart funding and co-design a kind of kickstart plus so that it's suitable for more disadvantaged young people and widen its eligibility to those not claiming um, universal credit better data sharing and also reflecting the London living wage in some of these programmes. And then in the longer term, we really want to build capacity with government work and work with government and young Londoners to come up with a London Youth Employment Pledge. And that might see boroughs and, and anchor institutions committing to generating more apprenticeship opportunities because we're really concerned about the reduction in that. Um, but also doing things like widening um, the reach of the, the youth hubs, building a better, more consistent career offer and offer and extending subsidised travel for 18 to 24 year olds. But that's a work in progress and um, we're keen to sort of develop that as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Can I now request Councillor Langton to go next, please? Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me as part of this uh, discussion. I hope you can hear me OK. I've got a bit of a sore throat. Um, I'm Rebecca Langton and I have responsibility for skills, growth and economic development at Nottingham City Council. So as we know, uh, COVID has had a huge impact on young people in the workplace. In Nottingham, since February 2020, we've seen a 74% rise in youth unemployment compared to about 60% in the general population. Since unemployment peaked in the summer of 2020, Youth unemployment has fallen more slowly in Nottingham City than in other parts of the East Midlands and in England. But of course, as we know, the COVID pandemic did not create these inequalities. In general, it's only exacerbated and highlighted existing trends. So like many other councils, Nottingham City Council has been working on issues relating to youth unemployment for many years. The issues facing young people in today's economy can be addressed, but we need to work cross-sector keeping the voices of young people at the heart of our plans and important, importantly, with a focus on greater powers locally to set priorities and to spend money. So I'm going to talk about two things, the Nottingham picture and what is holding us back. In Nottingham, we currently fund three offers for young people. The first is around neat prevention. We fund Futures, a council-owned company, a joint, own, sorry, a jointly owned company with the City Council and the County Council to deliver a neat prevention contract. This meets the council's statutory responsibilities around NEAT uh, monitoring and also delivers additional added value interventions, such as support for um, young people who are SEND and matching this to ESF provision. Interestingly, kind of as Tony said earlier, NEAT rates have remained fairly constant throughout the pandemic and haven't seen the same rise as youth unemployment overall. The second area we fund is a Nottingham Job Service. Nottingham Jobs is the City Council's unique employment and skills brokerage service delivered in partnership with the Council, the DWP and Nottingham Futures. It provides co-located specialist support to employers and to job seekers within Nottingham. And the final area is the ESF funded Nottingham Works for You programme. This supports 16 to 24 year old Nottingham City residents to access employment, education and training through ESF funding. We've developed close working relationships with the Council, Futures and the DWP to create a one service approach to engagement, careers advice, neat prevention, employment support and skills. This helps us match supply and demand and makes it easier for young people to navigate an otherwise complicated system. So what is holding us back? Many of the points I make about Nottingham will be true in other areas. And a simple answer to the what's next question is greater control um, over setting priorities and funding relating to employment support. In areas without devolution, like Nottingham, councils are often asked to deliver and sometimes even fund provision, but we don't necessarily have any control over the design. So some of the barriers. Nottingham lags behind national averages on level two and three study programmes. Foundation learning programmes are not necessarily accessible to many underrepresented groups within our communities due to low skill attainment levels. This can lead to disengagement and to need. The fragmented system in general is another barrier. The responsibility for youth employment sits across, as we all know, many different national government departments. Councils are using all the tools we have through combining national interventions and creating our own local provision. However, our ability to deliver is compromised by a system that is fragmented and siloed 
making it difficult for young people and for employers to navigate. Young people need a clear offer that they can access when they need to. The LGA's work local plan for a devolved and integrated employment and skills system recognises this. Nottingham, like many areas, is facing a financial cliff edge in December 2023 when the current ESIF funded programmes for employment support are due to end. It is critical that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund is launched in a coherent and timely manner, preventing significant gaps in provision. The long-awaited levelling up white paper needs to set out a long-term plan for youth unemployment underpinned by a coherent funding plan. Finally, engagement remains a challenge. Many young people who are unemployed are not claiming benefits and are therefore not required to engage with support. We need a serious programme of capital and revenue investment that invest in our communities to ensure we have provision through things like youth hubs to make sure that young people can access support and that they do so because it's easy. The biggest step the government take, could take to level up in this area would be to localise, yes, the funding, but just as importantly, the ability to set the direction for employment support programmes to a local level. This is not an ask for more money from local government, but it is an ask for control over how that money is spent. Whilst there are many common themes highlighted by the pandemic and in this discussion, the needs of both the economy and of young people differ from one area to another. Without the ability to set our own priorities, we're working with one hand tied behind our backs. But we're not just waiting around. We're also doing things whilst we wait. We're getting ready to launch the joint Nottingham City Council and Department for Work and Pensions Youth Employment Strategy. This represents an innovative collaboration bringing together policy, expertise and resources to reduce youth unemployment in the city's most disadvantaged communities. It plans to support 2,000 young people in Nottingham aged 16 to 29 to gain employment in the next two years. Local councils and their delivery partners know the needs of their communities and we want to deliver the interventions that make a difference so that we can build back a fairer economy. We can do this best through localised provision and we're ready to do that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Rebecca Langton, for telling us about youth employment in Nottingham. We're now going to move on to our Q&A session. Um, so I believe, Stephen, you've got the question first. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to try and um, make one question into two, or two questions into one, rather, the other way around. Um, um, so I know we'll kind of go around perhaps in, in reverse order to how you spoke first and if we can just uh, just quick answers of uh, up to a minute if you could please because then because she's got a, a second question we're going to try and squeeze in you are the last thing standing between people and a cup of coffee that's the one thing I'll say to you um, so um, we talked to there's loads of stuff going on um, already and Tony showed that uh, that slide with uh, an abridged list of initiatives um, uh, there as well there's probably more you could have put on um, how do we make sure that local government isn't kind of adding to that and, it, and is coordinating so in other words how, how do we and how do we make sure individuals are getting the support they need rather than just um, we've now got an even longer list of initiatives so so kind of um, maybe if we go in the sort of reverse order to how we how we spoke first so Rebecca let's start with you please yeah I think it's a really good question and I think you know, as I said in my presentation, um, that is has been and is one of the biggest challenges. Where do young people go? How do they navigate a really complicated system? I think we've done that, that quite well in Nottingham, I would say. Um, things like our Nottingham Jobs Programme, working with Nottingham Futures. Young people in Nottingham do know that Nottingham Futures is an organisation that they can contact, that they can easily talk to and have done. We've got um, really good evidence of young people accessing provision through them. So I think as local government, we have a responsibility to break it down and make it as simple as possible for young people to come through the door. So that includes things like uh, we've opened our first couple of youth hubs in the city. So um, we've, you know, we have a very diverse population in Nottingham. We've put them in communities where, um, you know, it, they may be traditionally in, in quotation marks harder to reach. We've made it so that young people can go um, get that support and not be kind of passed from one place to the next we see our role as a council to be that kind of single point of access that if you ring up and, and we can't answer your question we put you in touch with the right person so that you know we often know don't we it takes a while for people to reach out and if they get the kind of 
um, the right advice and support that first time, they're more likely to carry on with that. Whereas if they, um, you know, turned away, we wouldn't do that. So I think we have a good role in terms of doing that. I think it's a challenge and our ask back would be, can we simplify the process? You know, to some extent, we are experts in local government at doing that. That's our role a lot of the time to coordinate and to bring people together. So um, yeah, from government, we'd love we'd love it to be a bit more straightforward. Okay. Thank you. And Diana, so you, you've got you've got a mayor and you were listing some of his initiatives and then the boroughs as well. So how, how do you coordinate that together? It's, it's very complex in London. Yeah, we've got, you know, regional government, local government, and then London's huge because we've got like 33 local authorities. So we work with four sub-regional partnerships as well to break it down and make it a bit more manageable. Um, certainly this is a big issue in London and um, we're doing as part of that good work for all mission that I mentioned one element of that is called no wrong door or something like single front door but that is about how young people and others can better navigate the system and we're working with the boroughs with job centre plus um, with the sub-regional partnerships on developing things called integration hubs that try to link that up and do exactly what I think Councillor Langton was saying if somebody comes along um, where are you be, you know who's best place to provide that support for that person and, and knowing that and having frontline people know that and make good referrals um, we, um, we we managed the devolve work and health program and we got a lot of inappropriate referrals and so um, this is partly trying to say well you know that must be really demoralizing for somebody to sort of be referred to a program that you know and then they're told no it's not it's not right for you so we really want to make that work better in London and we're at the start of that process you know we're mapping customer journeys we're doing all of that but we have put some resource and funding aside to try and do that better data sharing as well sorry is absolutely crucial so that we know who's on what programme and that would really help too. Great, thanks Diana. And Claire, I guess you've got a similar sort of challenge with constituent local authorities and, and the Mayor of the West Midlands uh, as well. So how do you see us joining that together so the person gets what they need? Yeah, I mean, I mean, won't won't cover again what what um, Rebecca and Diana have said because it is exactly that. But I think you know my plea would be that that we should recognise that localities do that best. And instead of saying how do we make sure local government isn't adding to it, how do we make sure national government isn't creating it in the first place? That's that's a fair challenge. But yeah, flip it the other way around. Um, Tony, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on on this question at all. Yeah, look, I'll keep it super brief. I think I, so there's always going to be complexity um, and there's not, there's not always a huge amount we can do about loads of programmes. But what we can do is have really clear accountabilities and be really focused on the kind of outcomes that we want. And that's why we and the Youth Employment Group and Learning and Work and others and really everyone is saying we need an opportunity guarantee, a meaningful opportunity guarantee for young people. And that will then drive the system and it will drive services to deliver it. And we also think we need proper youth employment and skills boards locally, or more broadly, labour market employment skills boards from the work local model. And that will bring people together. And then let's hide the wiring. Let's make it easier. And it doesn't need to be full on Devo, as Claire said. It's it's It could be, I'd like to see that trailblaze, but it could also just be, you know, just much clearer accountabilities and much more operational autonomy and better joining up and giving people and having a culture where you can seek forgiveness rather than permission to make things work better locally. Uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, yes, I completely agree with that. Um, Kushi, I'm going to pass over to you because you've got a last question for us. And if we can just try and stick to uh, one or two sentence answers just to finish us off. So soundbite territory now. Uh, but uh, Kushi, over to you. Thank you. So we've got one question from the Slido um, and they've asked, what is one thing um, the panel would like to see in levelling up white paper in terms of yeah. dev? devolution and skills so. should we should we maybe start with uh, um, should we just reverse the order and maybe start with tony on that one yeah so i will keep it to one and something for everywhere would be this this idea of youth employment and skills boards or more broadly good work partnerships that would bring together kind of all of the key public services and business support um, and organisations that are working with young people in disadvantaged groups and just place much more of that power and control locally and much more and, and having a much clearer then 
um, deal between national government and local government around how we can improve outcomes. And that can then drive all the rest of the WYSI stuff they're going to announce in the white paper. Let's get the governments right and the partnerships. Thanks. And uh, I think uh, Claire next and then Diana and then Rebecca, please. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I mean, similar similar to Tony, I think um, you know the responsibility and accountability um, for delivering on this agenda with um, democratically elected um, leaders and a a true single skills and employment funding pot that is um, managed and directed at that level. Is it me now? Sorry. Yeah, Diana and Sorry. then Rebecca. I mean, Claire's done a brilliant summary, which I would, uh, you know, fully endorse. I think, you know, but a focus on the, you know, focus on tackling disadvantage. London is a place where there's been lots of opportunity, um, which is, you know, levelling up's about spreading opportunity, but we see groups still not benefiting from that. So I think there's got to be a real focus not to, to on the on the sort of most disadvantaged groups and providing them with real progression pathways, but doing that locally, but that needs to be reflected in the outcome between, you know, the outcome agreement, if there was one between national and local government. I don't think I've that more to, much more to add, really, but I was going to make that point about personalised support. I think that is really key. We've got to treat young people as individuals as they are. Um, and kind of my other one sentence would just be around the, we, we've made reference to the fact that the baseline isn't really changing there. Um, and, you know, I'm a big fan of the, the quote that the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. So what are we going to do differently at a national level to address that issue? I'd love to see um, more done about that. Fabulous. Thank you so much uh, to, to all of you, um, to Tony, to Claire, to Diana and to Rebecca. I think there's loads of brilliant stuff going on at local level in terms of new initiatives to fill the gaps, but also joining things up and trying to make things work uh, for young people. So thank you for sharing all your examples and perspective um, on that. It's much appreciated. And a huge thanks to uh, Cushy for co-chairing um, uh, to, today with me and also sharing some of her experience at the start as well so thank you to, to Kushi in particular as well. Um, we're now on to a coffee break um, so unfortunately unlike conferences in pre-pandemic worlds you have to go and um, find your own uh, coffee and biscuits I'm afraid. I've, I've got my eye on some hobnobs I managed to find in the, in the kitchen earlier but I, I wish I could share them but I can't. Um, so please stay, stay dialed in, go and get your coffee and your biscuits and what have you and then we'll be starting again at 11.30. Um, so we've got a great uh, panel of employers coming up. So please, uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes after you've got your coffee. Thanks everyone. <laughs>